is on viruses and biotechnology. Very happy today to have the first speaker, Roman Duma from the University of South Bohemia, who's going to tell us about light-driven chemistry inside a page head. Take it away, Roman. Good morning, everybody. So it's nice to see you all in person again. And thanks to the organizers for up this great meeting. So instead of uh, boring you with real life, which I also work on, uh, I selected a topic as a sort of a progress report on something we started about a year, year and a half ago, uh, which is application of space uh, to, uh, to actually uh, uh, chemistry. And uh, as you'll see, we tried to add some color to, to wire assembly. So the motivation for this is that uh, if you look at, you, you are all aware now about the energetic prices, the prices are going up, and, and inflation, and a lot of it is fueled by uh, the great consumption of industries of energy. And uh, as you could see, and I was also a bit surprised by this, chemicals account for, for a great deal of energy consumed. And uh, when you dig a little bit deeper into this, what is the reason for that? Well, industrial chemistry is still in place. A lot of processes were invented a hundred years ago, uh, and uh, most of the, the principles are basically press to pressurize the, the reaction, so increase the concentration, heat it up, and something happens, and then fractionated by a very crude phase separation, and then uh, go forward with the big volumes and, 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 and high pressures. Uh, uh, one way to reduce this uh, energy consuming process is to, to, to switch to from this indirect coupling of the chemical reaction to the thermodynamics to direct coupling. And we selected the uh, redox, uh, 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 redox chemistry because uh, that's driven by electron transfer. And we do have in, in biology a good example of a very efficient electron transfer, light run electron transfer system, which is the photo system. It essentially takes light, energizes electrons, and then they are then, then, uh, separated, and they, they, can, they can then reduce and drive other redox reactions uh, down the stream. And this is exactly what we want to do. So it's our mission statement here. We want to sort of package this, these enzymes, these pathways into, into a, a, a virus and uh, drive reactions all the way down to, let's say, reduction of, of CO2 to methanol. The other uh, uh, reaction which might be down uh, 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 further down the path is the uh, using the nitrogenase complex, which could be also coupled to redox uh, uh, flux to the uh, electron uh, transport uh, and replace the habit uh, process, which is still used for fertilizer uh, uh, after uh, more than 100 years. So we don't have anything back here. And that's also consumes quite a bit uh, of energy. So uh, uh, why did uh, we, we chose to, to go after this uh, reduction of CO2? Because CO2 is essentially comes to cheap. You can get it free for, for, for transport from companies because they are supposed to sequester it. There is a, they are a byproduct for, of other gas industry. So if you, if you uh, get liquid nitrogen, you get uh, as, as a byproduct uh, uh, CO2, which is essentially for free. So you can get compressed CO2. Uh, in great quantities, and there will probably be time when CO2 uh, uh, people pay as for waste to, to get rid of it because the emission uh, uh, emission trading emission trading so, uh, and quota. So, so this uh, is um, the other reason is that here is already some booming industry around this uh, this business in, in, in chemistry. So we have great competition, uh, but the uh, from point of view of, of biochemistry, it's relatively easy, and you could uh, see that uh, one of the use of CO2 for uh, energy gas, the syn syn gas production, it, it only requires one enzyme, and paradoxin, uh, reduced paradoxin, which as you would see, the photosystem can actually produce. Uh, what we are after is this pathway, which requires three enzymes, so it's formate dehydrogenase, formate uh, formaldehydrogen, alcohol dehydrogenase, and this, this is a very common enzyme that's used in, in undergraduate labs. So, uh, and this is always being fueled by a reduced NADH, which is then oxidized. And again, this can be coupled to the process system. Uh, there are attempts in, in chemical industry or, or, or uh, uh, run by physical chemistry research 
One example is this light driven reduction of NAD to NAD8, which can be done on glass beads, or this uh, uh, formate dehydrogenase being reduced by electron flux from electrodes with electrically driven essentially to reduce uh, CO2 into formate. So that's the first step in, in, in the conversion. So this has been realized already, so we do have some competition. But the problem with these approaches is, uh, is the following, because you need to couple all these things out of the whole pathway to electron flux. An electron, unlike a proton, is not soluble. That's a quantum mechanical beast which jumps between molecules using quantum mechanical rules so, uh, or travels through vacuum. If, if, if there is water exists, essentially if the wall recombines or gets lost. So for uh, effective electron transfer, you have to have a real contact between the uh, uh, donor and acceptor. So that's the essentially a 10x from one nanometer system. So that comes from Marcus theory and also the distance dependence is exponential, so it goes down very quickly. Uh, the photo system is actually very efficient in this. It's got uh, basically eons of evolution behind uh, this, this uh, electron transfer fraction, electron transfer pathway. So you get the electron excited, there's uh, the special pair which uh, separates uh, the, the electron and, and, uh, and then the electron that travels this path very quickly. This in, uh, uh, this in nanoseconds or microseconds gets here. Then in, in the photo system one, it, 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 this then coupled to third oxygen, and you recognize this from the previous slide, uh, that this could be then used to, to uh, uh, convert the CO2 to thin gas, or further down with the uh, third oxygen reductase, which is also on this pathway, and directly coupled to, to an ADPA, an ADPH uh, redox chemistry, and that's uh, the, the second point pathway, and this is what we uh, focus on. And uh, um, so, uh, the, the photo systems are very advanced advantage because they are uh, relatively abundant and worked on. They, just, they were the first membrane proteins to be crystallized and, and the structure solved already in the 80s. So, uh, so they are well worked uh, on and so uh, uh, and relatively soluble in, in my cells, they are soluble membrane proteins. So, where the phage comes into it? So, so the, the phage is essentially a vessel into which put all these uh, enzymes, and then this is based on, on, on Pierre Pioneer's work of Dr. Peter Privilege and then uh, Charlie Beverly, who uh, actually put the alcohol and adrenaline into the, the P22 capsid using the scaffold uh, linkage. So, so the, the alcohol and adrenaline is linked to the scaffolding protein fragment, which then can uh, catalyze the assembly as well as the uh, link. The, the cargo into the, the unwind the, the, you know, in the surface of the, of the capsule. And then this is still active, so you can, you can reduce or oxidize whatever you want to the alcohol dehydrogenase. And this is the, the last thing I wanted to uh, put in there. So, uh, so this is all great, and this can be done in any coli cell. So you clone the, the, into the assembly of your target, and this will assemble any coli. But we have a problem because the uh, uh, photo system is a large assembly. It is about uh, more than more, more than and then, uh, 50, 50 proteins, uh, 50 subunits, and uh, pigments. And obviously, it's not compatible with E. coli. E. coli does, it doesn't have the design of these pigments. And likewise, there is no assembly system for, let's say, a rotobacter we work on, uh, which would have the photosynthetic uh, uh, apparatus, and also how you get the apparatus of the, the, the the, uh, the membrane. So uh, we had to, to resort to the relatively old fashioned Nike's technology of in vitro assembly. And that's uh, where my expertise came on because that's what, what I was doing in Peter's lab. But I was posed to ask, so I was all you know, brushed up uh, or, or dusted off the old notebooks and then looked back. And we did quite a bit on, on optimization and uh, uh, investigation of assembly pathways, including the uh, Small and express scattering, so I could sort of build on that expertise and then start to uh, work from that. So, we selected for the first time, we selected uh, the photo system uh, from Rhodobacter spiroides. The, the advantage is we do have it all in the lab. We do have the, the host, which can be genetically manipulated. This whole beast is, is in stack uh, on the H subunit here, and you could see uh, it is also two to four one package. Apart from the, uh, the uh, reaction center, where there are large and medium subunits and the H subunit on the cytoplasmic side, 
uh, you have the belt of light harvesting complex, which is uh, composed of an important species escape dimer, which is composed of, of, of 58 subunits, alpha beta subunits with pigment in between, so they are, they are buckled for and, and, uh, 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 and the carotenoids, so which increases the absorption uh, power, uh, uh, cross section of, of the whole system, so, so more, more likely to be utilized. And it's effectively transferred uh, by energy transfer uh, to, to the reaction center, which does not really be redox uh, and it's pretty electron uh, separation. And, and it can be isolated as this design uh, of the user and manipulated. The H subunit could be truncated, and so we can pack the electrons from different places with different potentials. Uh, as well as the idea was uh, to uh, uh, link it directly to the scaffold on the H subunit because they managed in our collaborators, uh, uh, Tom B. from the uh, University of British Columbia, uh, developed the system and he managed to, to add with his cytochromes to it, so small proteins. So we tried to link it to to the scaffold, and here is the alpha fold model of the SP141 half scaffold, which is used in the assembler. And you can see that the C terminus of the A subunit is red here. It links pretty well when the model is still echo. This uh, on the dimer is the dimer of the scaffold, so we thought, well, this is your best. Uh, and guess what? It wasn't because uh, this is a member protein. So if you link it, the A subunit is critical. Uh, 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 it's got one transmembrane, uh, transmembrane uh, uh, helix, which is critical for the assembly whole thing. And we didn't get any purple. Uh, well, we got very, very little purple color on these, uh, on, on, on these uh, bacteria, so it means that the, the uh, whole st the system is compromised and can't assemble well. So what we did instead is uh, 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 did sort of bioconjugation approach. And so we engineered the um, uh, truncated scaffold, uh, which has already sustained at its end terminus uh, right after his back. So we, 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 we thought, well, maybe we can use the system to, to link it up with uh, NTA and load it with, with nickel and then hook it up to the already existing reaction center his stack uh, and, and then get the bifrons to in vitro. Uh, so, so we engineered uh, a, 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 a fluid type to get rid of the scaffold his stack, which is that for, for ease of purification. And then uh, uh, after that, we modified this system to a reagent uh, and got uh, the modified uh, scaffold. And this NTA loaded with nickel and complexed with the photosynthetic uh, uh, beads, which I show you uh, previous slide, and uh, used this in the assembly. And uh, then the hard part, in which I was found, so I'm mostly more. Uh, came to actually optimize this because yeah, I can assemble any time even like when you wake me in, in, in the middle of the night I can assemble P22 metro yes but this was a different story because you have to consider what ratio to use that uh, so we want to have like let's say uh, based on the, the size you have to two maybe three of these diamonds inside capsules and you don't need more because you need to stuff in there more enzymes further down the line uh, so you probably don't need that much and I knew that, for example, portal uh, 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 can uh, actually the nucleation of a uh, uh, co assembly. So I thought maybe if we mix first co-protein uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the um, uh, reaction center, and then I scaffold, maybe that's the way to go. So to, to nucleate from there, you'll get one diamond of capsid. Uh, so order of addition was one thing to consider, then the ratios. How much extra you know, do you have? Uh, one to one hundred ratio between the the uh, reaction center and, and the rest of the components. If you want to have like, about one or two per capsid, and then the uh, absolute concentration, which obviously are uh, always limited by the uh, uh, solubility. So it's uh, in micromole range, so we can't really go that high with it. Uh, and then mix it, and then see what happens. How you see what happens? Basically, adopted the uh, Adam Slotnik uh, approach with uh, fast HPLC. So, we use like one of these uh, uh, TSK columns, which is the steel column here, runs uh, about 20 minutes each. And then, so we load the, the, the we, we progress with the assembly for about an hour or two, depending on, on the kinetics which we monitor by turbidity. 
and uh, then analyze the products and then do following analysis. So we do composition analysis by country proteomics because we have high value frames in SDS page as well as membrane proteins we don't stain very well and they are not very abundant if you have one center over 400 uh, acid subunit. So, uh, so this is uh, this is a uh, uh, lot more quantitative. Yeah. And uh, um, then we check for structural uh, uh, integrity by negative stain and, 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 and check the spectra. So the first attempt was uh, not so successful. So we've got uh, some free code, some shells here, but they were not actually shells, they were quite larger. And you could see that they were fragments, but lots of this is, uh, this is unpurified stuff. So lots of uh, these, these aggregates of the centers with code proteins, some partial shells. So after some optimization, and the main thing was the uh, uh, changing the switching in order of addition of components. So we used to actually excess of uh, RC pre incubated with scaffold, then only an added code, and then that took more and more successful. So we, we went through most of the code was actually assembled, and then uh, we got a uh, uh, few RCs, as you could see here inside. Probably good shell. Some of them are not completely closed, but the main thing is they are concentrated, which is it. We don't need to have it perfect. This is good for material science. We are not after, let's say, biology. So that uh, sort of was good. And also contained by quantum, uh, uh, proteomics contains one to four RC per per capsid. So we, we take the spectrum. So it was also containing the, the main peak here at, 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 at 870. So that's the, the special pair absorption. So the, the RC is there. But that the, due to scattering, it was hard to spot the, the uh, light harvesting complex, so we don't know whether there is full complement, although quantitative proteomics tells us it's about the same ratio as the RC here, so these are the genes for the small proteins of light harvesting about. And so, so it should be complete. Uh, but that needs to be uh, further uh, examined by, by uh, fast spectroscopy and energy transfer and electron transfer electrochemistry, which requires a lot more materials, so I sort of went into lab and then did a more streamlined procedure, which is based on the centrifugation. You could see here there's the purple spin reaction centers, the excess is the main contaminant is the excess of this. So we layer on the cushion and we get purple phase here, phase the pearl head, so, so that's the color there. Uh, even without the further purification, they look reasonably good for what we want to do, and we got enough of it, so it's now the electrochemistry and fast spectroscopy is, is being done. Anyway, we don't have time to discuss it. It's a bit more elaborate, so it's for a different meeting. And we have started a conclusion, so we, we managed to get the, uh, by, by conjugation, the reaction center in there. Uh, the, there are a few photosynthetic reaction centers, so we need to check that they are still functional, and based on spectra, it should be. And uh, then we are working on paradox and uh, paradox and reductase down the line. So we want to, uh, I think it's time to, to look at the, into the intermediates to further improve this process to, to look uh, at this assembly in more great detail. So we open the, the so assembly modeling back because there's a need for it because we don't really understand what's going on there in the early stages and, and uh, then incorporate further enzymes with it and uh, PS1 is down, uh, is, is already being, being purified. And this is a bit heresy, but perhaps we could use one of these PRD1 type greasy pages to get uh, this one. If we, if we had one which infects protobacter, for example. If anybody knows about something like that, then let me know. So thank you for your attention, and then we have these other people who were involved with our survival. Sports day, these two guys were busy actually doing stuff for me, so I'm not participating. And thanks. So, thanks very much. Uh, first question, Lowry. Next question. Uh, okay. uh, super cool stuff. Um, one thing I was, was just kind of wondering about you mentioned that. Um, uh, the concentration of the calcium they were like uh, 10 micromolar, something like that. Uh, how does this, how do you see the yield of this? Like, if you, for example, go out to the hardware board process, which, you know, tons of tons of stuff needs to be made, are these going to 
Well, we are not replacing it, so <laughs> and I think we thought the harbor bush uh, in particular would be the yield of the nitrogen. That's a beast of uh, an enzyme on its own. Uh, like photosystem in, in comparison with that is easy. So, uh, so uh, yeah, we are early days, so we need to like proof of principle, you know, just to get in there. Uh, the yields are good enough for the spectroscopy, so, so more than enough for, for trial, which we are working on to see more power to the data and you know, it's heterogeneous in the end. So, so uh, obviously, yeah, it is the research uh, scale. So, um, like, that's why I mentioned this greasy stage, because, you know, the, the assembler system which Pearl Douglas has got, that's a good in, in industrial application of it already. So, uh, if we get it into that stage somehow, then it will be better. The in vitro system, yeah, yeah, you are talking about like, if you talk to uh, industrial chemists about HPLC purification, they will tell you that it's not viable in, in industry. You have to use hot phase separation because it's too much and too slow. Right, uh, right here. Yeah. Uh, that's very interesting. Uh, I think that uh, the lipids are not important for this because usually they're all biological systems. You have to have lipids to use this like the transfer dimensionality and everything to come together. How would it work in our system? So, uh, the, the, that's why we, you know, we started this photosystem and the, the, the reaction sensors that we did because they are proved, proved to be active and, and uh, in so the native state in my cells. There's a very little detergent, so they are not that dependent on a particular, uh, particular lipid. All, overall, the whole photosystem, and this is basically interplay between photosystem 1 and photosystem 2 and the, the oxygen evolving uh, organisms, that's, that's where, where the lipids come into it. And, and they also come into it when you have a system which is self-repairing. Because the, 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 these, these uh, systems, and I would also, that might, might be also limiting, is photo damage to these, because there's a lot of energy coming through those. And in, in, in the photosystem, are constantly being repaired and replaced in the membranes. And so that's where the lipids and then the whole uh, uh, assembly machinery, which is inside of the membrane. Right. Just a comment on the research, so then it's fun, but how long project we've had like, years ago trying to incorporate the membranes into the organism. No success whatsoever. We'd be much better going with something which has lots of the lungs which we don't feel. So it is a bit of a question to discuss and you know, I would long shot. Maybe it's the important thing that this thing is Okay, uh, one very, very, very short last question. Uh, yes. Would you care to compare uh, your approach with my processors who uses tobacco mosaic virus directly for the same thing? Well, uh, the, in, our, in our case, um, the uh, in, 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 in this case, what, uh, what we can do, we can, we can work with uh, bulk, so, so basically it could be a total self-contained uh, or immobilized on the surface. So, uh, P32, uh, because Charles Douglas figured out how to put it on the surface, how to make like uh, composite materials from it. It's got advantage that there's a lot more sort of downstream nanotechnology from, from this. Uh, unlike in for the for the uh, for, for the road light viruses, which might be harder to handle when it comes to the surface. I, I'm not that much familiar with what the, what they do downstream from it, but we were always thinking, well, eventually we need to get it on electrode because we need to return the electrons in the loop. I wasn't working much about uh, talking about the physical chemistry, but you, you eventually need to close the circuit. So eventually, it works in some ways as solar panels. Uh, you need a, uh, 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 it doesn't mean electricity will generate some, uh, but you need to close the circuit somehow. And that's why the electrodes come in and further assemble. Okay. Thanks very much, Roma. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Kay Choi, who's uh, from Bloomington, Indiana. Who's going to tell us about the RNA assisted RNA? Yeah, so you probably noticed that I changed my title. Um, if we are the 529 said, I apologize. I didn't think I can compete with uh, PJ. <laughs> All right, so, <laughs> so 
uh, so we just uh, built a new uh, HID RNA structure that I would like to share with you today. Okay, so the HID has a small 9 kb RNA genome that produces 15 proteins by uh, RNA splicing. So the fully spliced 2 kb RNA uh, encodes for test, web, and lab proteins. And the single splice of 4.5 kb RNA transcripts encode for envelope, bit, BTI, and BTU. And only splice the 9 kb genomic transcripts in code for gas and core precursors. So this RNA splicing can maximize uh, information content of the small RNA genome, but that also causes a new set of problems. And that is, so when, uh, at the early phase of, uh, phase of the HIV life cycle, only the fully spliced RNA transcripts are made from the integrated viral DNA. And these RNAs can export out the cytoplasm by a nuclear export uh, system. Uh, and then these RNAs can be translated to form a viral protein. And one of the proteins is called the web protein. But at the later stage of the HIV uh, life cycle, the partially spliced and unspliced RNA transcripts are made. And they cannot uh, transport out to the cytoplasm and they are detained in the nucleus because the standard nuclear export pathway does not work. So to overcome this problem, HIV uses this RNA signal. I don't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's called a uh, web response element, so this RNA. And then this web protein translocates back to the nucleus, uh, binds to this RNA signal, then recruit additional uh, nucleus export proteins and export it out of the nucleus. And this uh, RNA is then translated, and also the uh, full length genome is used for video assembly. So the, the web response element is a 350 nucleotide long, highly structured intronic RNA, and that contains four to five predictive stem root structures, stem one to five. So here's a stem one, the really long uh, double stranded RNA. And there is a stem loop 2, which is a branch. And here is a stem loop 3 and 4, and there is a stem loop 5. So RRE binds 6 to 8 copies of web protein and forms the RRE web oligomer complex. And this complex forms a nuclear export complex with a CRM1 and then G2, then translocate from the nucleus to the cytoplasm. So there are two known web binding sites on RRE the stem loop 2 and stem 1. So in stem loop Two, three, two, okay. So consists of the stem A, stem loop B, and stem loop C. And this internal loop in stem loop 2B is suggested to be the initial high affinity web binding site. And the secondary uh, web binding site is identified in the 1A internal loop. And stem loop 3 to 5 are non essential in web binding. And it uh, has been shown that web oligomerization begins at the high affinity site here and somehow proceeds in a single direction on RRE. However, it is not known how the RRE structure directs the arrangement of the six to eight copies of web oligomer, given that there are only two web binding sites. So to better understand the mechanism of how RRE interacts with web, we show the structure of the uh, stem loop two. Maybe you didn't. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the high initial high affinity uh, web binding site. Uh, so but before I show you the structure. <laughs> okay. So I will just tell you quickly how we show the structure because it's not easy to show the RNA structure. So there are only small number of RNA structures available in CDB, and about 0.8% of all sorts of structures are RNA-only structures, which will be this tiny little type. And most of these RNA structures are either very large ribosomes or very small double-stranded RNA cells. And the medium-sized RNA structure that ranges between 50 to 200 nucleotides 
are even smaller. And that is because the medium size is a too big for NMR because the NMR is too much over there. It is too small for carrying a little microscopy, leading to a low contrast, and it is difficult to crystallize uh, the RNA due to their flexibility. So one focus of my lab is to develop a structural RNA scaffold to facilitate RNA structure determination. So we are using a pRNA scaffold and pRNA scaffold approaches to build the structure by X-ray crystallography and cryo microscopy. So I'll just tell you a little bit more about pRNA scaffold approach because this is a method that we use to build the RNA structure. Okay, so in the pRNA scaffold approach, we take a pRNA and replace the anti-codon loop with the viral RNA sequence to form this pRNA viral RNA fusion RNA. So this is the actual sequence that we use to build RRAs from the chip. So we start five prime end of the pRNA and then insert the entire length of the stem loop tube and then come down our uh, end with the three prime pRNA. And we synthesize this as a gene in the plasmid and express it in E. coli and we can purify it easily with a, a single ionic change in the target. So you can see the pRNA viral RNA, this particular one, is a very pure, which is uh, what we use for crystallization. Okay, so there are several advantages of the pRNA scaffold approach over the T7 RNA transcription. The first, the pRNA scaffold creates a homogeneous three prime end, while the T7 RNA polymerase has extra nucleotide at the three prime end. The pRNA prevents the unwinding of the double stranded RNA helix at the end, unfolding. You can imagine the unfolding at the five prime and three prime end to create a conformation of heterogeneity, which would prevent the crystallization. We produce our RNA uh, in E. coli using a plasma, so we can make a large quantity of RNA. But the typical yield for us is about one milligram of RNA pure from a one liter culture. So you can see this is a cost effective because NTP and our reagents for T7 RNA transcription are quite expensive. But one of the uh, biggest advantages for us, the pRNA facilitates crystallization providing an RNA-RNA context site. So we have used this uh, pRNA scaffold approach, and we saw uh, five new RNA, viral RNA structures. From a dengue, we got to the polio virus, and now the HIV RNA structure. Okay. 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 So the uh, RNA are crystallized in two forms, the open form and a closed form. And um, here, we pRNA is a shown in purple, and the, uh, the top part is the RRA stem loop two. The stem loop two from a three-way junction, and stem B, three, uh, is that the coaxial of stem A, and then stem loop C projects about 60 to 70 uh, degree angle from the double standing island house. The two forms of the uh, stem loop two differ in the base pairing patterns in the three-way junction where the stem A, stem loop B, and C meet. Okay, so when we look at the open conformation first, then we see the predicted secondary structure is not correct. So what happens is the, this new predicted UA base pair does not form, and this new base pair is with this A instead of that A, and forming a, a UA base pair. So the stem A, then A is extended by one base pair. Also, this is G and G form a purine purine uh, base pair. And we can see that one of the uh, G bases is flipped to the uh, skin conformation. And the rest of the uh, nucleotides are all single skin uh, stranded. So this predicted GC base pair does not form, and thus this upper A junction is more open compared to the other form. So what we can tell is that this, uh, the high affinity web binding site in stem loop 2 b does not form internally. Okay. So instead, it is incorporated into the three-way junction. In the closed form uh, of the stem loop 2, it is similar to the open form that the UA based pair forms extend the stem A a little bit, and then CG based pair forms. And additionally, this CU form of uh, water-based pair, and the rest of them are single-stranded. So because of this, 
the uh, three-way junction is a uh, like sort of single stranded loop, and it's more close than the three-way junction. Uh, similar to the open form, that the web, the web binding site is incorporated into the three-way junction. So if we compare the two conformations, then we can see the structural differences are really limited to the three-way junction. And if you uh, overlay the individual system, it will overlay very well. Okay, so here I'm going to show the morphing from the closed or the open forms. So roughly stem loop B uh, will take about 20 degrees, and uh, stem loop C will take from uh, about 30 degrees. Okay, so why is this important? <laughs> so uh, that is because the three-way three junction is the initial web binding site, that GGGC system, and the web protein binds in the widened RNA major group. So the, when we compare the three-way junction, the width of the major group in the open conformation is about six days from wider than that of the closed form, suggesting that web protein binds the open conformation. So the web protein is very small, about 116 amino acids, consisting of the N-terminal domain that forms a helix conjoint and a C-terminal disordered uh, domain. So the N-terminal domain consists of RNA binding arginine, rich motif called ARM, which is this orange, and then flanked by a two oligomerization domains uh, that provide a hydrophobic interaction between the polymer. Okay, so it has been shown that two web proteins bind the RRA stem loop 2 as a dimer. So we can tell where the first web binding site is. That is going to be high affinity web binding site, the GGGC, in the stem 2 group, now in the three way junction. And it was suggested the second web binding site, which is not sequence specific, but it's going to be near the three way junction. So, how does the uh, RRA bind the web? So, we model the first web binding site using the previous determined structure of the web and the stem loop to be healthy. So here's a sequence of the stem loop protein that has uh, previously determined. And this is GGGC, is the where the uh, first web binding site is. So which I highlighted in there. And then web binds in the GGGC sequence in the widened major group. So what I'm uh, going to do is we are going to overlay this protein structure with our uh, RNA with found web protein. Okay, so the GGGC sequence is highlighted in that. We overlaid with the hair pin, with the bound web protein, and I simply remove the hair pin. Okay. So that we can see the web protein fits well in the open form of the stem loop 2 in the three way junction in the major group. All right, so where does the second web binding stand? So the second web binding site was modeled using a web dimer. So web dimer structures have shown that the angle between the two RNA binding motifs uh, can range from the 50 to 140 degrees. So what I'm going to do is overlay the web dimer with one of the monomers that we uh, modeled already and other just the angle. So if we look at the web uh, bound structure, Actually, there's only one place can, uh, not a web can bind, because the web binds only in the major group, which is right here. Okay. So I aligned with this structure in green, and then I adjust to the angle just a little bit, and then remove this dimer structure. All right, so web dimer uh, is very likely by the three-way junction across the stem B and stem C, which will be consistent with the web binding uh, data. Okay, so what do we learn from the structure? So the open and closed form of the RRA stem loop structures differ in the three-way junction, where the high affinity web binding site is located. The open form has a wider major group than the closed form, and likely binds web protein with a little distortion. And the closed form would require a distortion in the RNA structure 
it's verb on to the other one. So uh, we think that uh, the second verb binding site on our is it's a likely the three-way junction with stem C, which will be the verb adjacent to the higher primitive site. And the, the second verb binding site has a flexible fast plate platform because it's single stranded allowing the formation of an Elijah laser there. So this will be consistent with the previous report that stem C is required for verb oligomerization. So I told you that the verb oligomerization occurs in a single direction along the RRE, starting from the higher primary side in stem term. So uh, clearly, the direction of the assembly is determined by the structure of the RRE stem term. And uh, what we think is happening is the binding of the initial web monomer that determines the direction of the propagation by because it provides a hydrophobic surface that form a uh, primer interface. All right, so that is it. Um, so the crystal structure that I showed was sold by Jericho Tripo, a college and the PhD student. And here's the copy I haven't told you today, but I was doing the web uh, Kyrian structure. And Kyrian is got for the truth was uh, initiated by a former uh, postdoc. Okay, uh, and I'd like to thank the uh, financial support for the lab. And um, some of you know that I moved to Indiana University, and this is our first structure of you. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Next question there, Peter. Have you tried any dynamic measurements yet to see uh, the rates or the distribution space between these two forms? Um, and, uh, and, uh, uh, no, we haven't. But uh, we, what we have done, so I, we didn't have a time to show you, but uh, we have done some, some binding essays. Yeah, and then the, the binding of the web peptide and then web peptide plus the legalization domain. It's a little bit different, but I don't. But I, we we might try the molecular uh, dynamic relations. Yeah, we don't know. Lovely talk. Hi, I'm here. How are you? So, a question: These two versions of the sender. What is the difference in free energy between them? Are they very similar? And then that might be which that is induced by the vector molecule. So, it's the customer energy, the two versions of the standard is the real uh, junction. So, uh, <laughs> so just as pure calculation, yeah, it is similar because the only difference really is the one more uh, GU base pair. That's right. So, it could be that it's actually a um, golden ensemble, there are different folds. Mm -hmm. And then when your molecule comes, it just selects the one right yes, and bind yes. in so the regular right. and so, oh, sorry. Yeah. so one of the things it's known is it's not like a web protein goes into nucleus and all of a sudden they're starting to export the uh, RNA. So you have to accumulate a little bit. And uh, so this is a really total hand writing. But <laughs> what I think it could happen is it might have to bind to the once you bind the closed form, and then somehow they uh, make it into the open form, and then that is the one uh, goes. Uh, so I'm not sure whether it will be like in just a fit that it goes into the closed form and somehow opens up, or it selects for the open form, and then that's why it takes a little bit to get closed. Thank you so much. Here's a good question. How, how much of the influence of your structure will increase that context? How much influence? Yes. Uh, quite a lot. So, <laughs> so all these five structures that we have sold so far, and some of them has a pure interaction. It's a PRNA, PRNA interaction. So uh, I, when we started, we didn't know it would work this well, honestly. So what I think is happening is a lot of these stemless structures can be really crystallized because it looks like a mushroom, right? So the tail, I don't know why they call the bottom part, but they do not really touch well. So what TR and Scuffle do is they provide another, like, upside down mushroom head. So that kind of creates the pattern. Mm. So I think, so if you notice, all of our RNAs that we saw the structure so far is between the 70 and um, 90. 
So that is about the size of a piano note, which is a seven unit. Hmm. Yes, they are all different. Thank you very much indeed. Okay. Our next speaker is Bogdan Dragner, uh, from, also from Indiana University, and he's going to tell us about the thermodynamic mechanical and quantum properties. Um, yes, so uh, the title looks like a uh, three-year curriculum, uh, so um, um, there is no, uh, no other way, actually, to bring you to the punchline, I, I thought, uh, but I will go pretty quick uh, to, uh, uh, to explain um, what I think about uh, unique mechanical and thermodynamic properties of RSSR that, that would lead to the punchline, which is... Uh, of a form of light emission from a, a from a nanoparticle that uh, does not you are not going to see anywhere else um, with any other materials at least at room temperature. Um, so you know, for those of you who are jet lag, you might want to take a nap until slide number twenty. But please do wake up at twenty because it's going to be one slide that is really important. Uh, I will I will point it out. <coughs> So, uh, why do we do this? This is my motivation uh, slide. Well, really, the short explanation is this: because we can, and no one else can. Uh, and, and so, but but um, uh, there are a lot of there is a lot of activity in in the, in the uh, area of uh, phage and virus technology, and we have imaging uh, agents that have been explored in targeted delivery and and vaccines, but as it has been pointed out in the first talk, um, um, in terms of chemical engineering and making that of this stuff, we are not definitely not there. But the properties of, of your materials, of your phages, are just mind-blowing. And so I'm going to try to um, intertwine these, these properties from, from the point of view of different disciplines and, and um, explain uh, qualitatively, how how uh, they they turn out to be quite outstanding you know, from the point of view of a new of a new application, which is the emission of light. You heard in, in Roman Thomas Thomas talk uh, about collecting light to to produce chemistry. In our case, we are going to uh, emit it. Uh, so, um, well. Um, there are some on the way. Uh, we've been working on this for a few years, actually, a couple of decades. But but um, it, there are related questions of biological importance that, that we have tumbled uh, on 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 this path, and uh, and um, you know there are and they are still there. Like how and why some viruses achieve remarkably precise stoichiometry at assembly. How the virus mechanics is tuned for specific function, genome protection, absorption, entry. Now, how will exogenous cargo or added components um, uh, will will change uh, the, the protein cage stability and rigidity, and what what kind of of influence does that have for for function? And, and so we are developing methods sometimes from scratch in order to to be able to uh, answer these these questions before we get to the physics of virus-like particle emitting laser-like light. And so, this is a three-part presentation. We are, the, the key role here is mechanics. Um, and I know that you, um, many of you have presented uh, beautiful uh, models, beautiful uh, pictures of the dynamics that come on, comes out of a, a beautifully resolved uh, structure. We are more, much more myopic in sort of blend bunches of molecules together to, to, to look at large scale, but still sub virus scale uh, mechanical properties, which are going to be important, as I said, for the, for the punchline. 
Now we have a, the, um, a, a way to address these mechanical properties is actually through th thermodynamics because energy scales at the virus scale are there is a confluence of thermal energies and mechanical energies, and so you can use one to learn from the other. All right, so my virus, so the, the, my system is not a phage, but this is the bromozyte virus, which is like this, you know, textbook uh, a system of six years uh, of, of research. And this is why, you know, I picked it up basically, because it's quite, quite known, and I think that many of you know about it. It's a C equals three non envelope single stranded RNA virus, icosahedral, that's going to be important. Um, and so, uh, I want to talk a little bit about its mechanics and, and, and how do we measure particle stiffness at physiological conditions? How does non-cognate and cognate cargo influence particle mechanics, which, which will lead to improved design criteria? And for those who think about uh, delivery, therapeutic delivery, this kind of, these kinds of questions actually in general could could, uh, could uh, lead to better principles of design. We still don't know whether we should design soft, malleable particles, carriers, or rigid shape ones are better for delivery. There are two ways to learn about the mechanics of a virus. One is by using atomic force microscopy. You just look at the topography of, of a virus that, that sticks to the surface. Imagine a liquid droplet that, that goes and adheres to the surface. The surface pulls on it. The liquid droplet has surface tension, tries to resist that squeezing, and you end up with a shape. If you measure that shape, you learn about the addition of the, of the virus, the energy of addition of the virus, and the elastic energy that opposes. This is called contact mechanics. And if you do uh, this kind of experiment with the bromosaic virus, and you look, uh, for instance, at uh, two substrates here, we have graphite and we have mica, you see distributions of height. This is what we measure. Where is the apex of the virus above the surface? You see there are exponential uh, um, distributions of height, and that comes from the fact that the free energy or elastic uh, uh, change, you know, the free energy corresponding to, to a mechanical change, uh, is um, determined up to AT. Uh, and so you have a Boltzmann distribution, and you can estimate the elastic energy from that from that Boltzmann distribution, which we did here. You will need a, a little model to, to go through through this. The next, uh, the, the other way to uh, find out how elastic a virus is, what are its mechanical properties, is to pretty much plot it with an atomic force microscope. You take a big probe. Uh, relative to the virus, the mechanical probe, and you squish the virus, and you ask the question how much force it takes to squish that virus by a certain distance. Yeah, and here you have a uh, typical um, force displacement curve. Uh, first it acts elastically, then it buckles and it, it breaks under pressure, and this is just a substrate. And you, when you retract it, it's stuck to the it's stuck to the substrate, and the tip is stuck to the substrate, and this is why it's going uh, doing this hysteresis. Now, the important thing about this is what is the birth pressure of wild type B and B, uh, which is a virus that is held together by about a thousand kBT energy, so five kBT per per subunit. Um, uh, so, really uh, weak interactions, but the birth pressure is 100 psi. Now, the people in the face community will say, well, we, we have, uh, you know, we have 60 psi in 529, this is not a large pressure. I think it is, because if you try to hand pump your bicycle wheel at 100 psi, First of all, you are going to get exhausted. Second, the, the tire will pop. And actually, 150 psi is the same birth pressure, check it on Wikipedia, for this type of tire. Um, so it's amazing how the virus achieves this kind of resilience to mechanical pressure. 
So how does it do it? Well, there are contributing factors. First of all, there is geometric frustration. That assembly stresses are born out of necessary topological effects. Pentamers and hexamers, when you, you make them to, to be included in a cage, if you plot this, the mechanical stresses, the elastic energy uh, differences between them, you get a, a plot that looks like this, with the stresses concentrated at the five fold vertices. Because the stiffness is the second derivative of this energy, you are going to have there very stiff vertices. The second, so the strain field follows symmetry. Symmetry is important because it's going to determine the stiffness. Um, um, the, um, the second thing is the RNA inside the promosaic virus. The RNA here exerts a negative pressure on, on the shell. And so it's a little bit like a bicycle wheel, where you stiffen the, the um, rim of the wheel by tensioning the hubs. And uh, so the, the second, the third thing are intrinsic curvature effects. You start with proteins in solution, uh, whose structure we don't know what it is in solution, but they, they get stuck in this case. And so it's like, you know, imagine that you have a bunch of ice cream cones and you try to build uh, uh, a sphere uh, out of them. Well, if you are, the ice cream cone will have a certain radius of curvature defined, defined by the angle at the tip. And so when you want to make this closed shell, you are perhaps going to end up with a hole that you cannot fill with an ice cream cone. So you have to stuff it. If the ice cream is nice and soft, you will be successful, but there will be stress coming from the fact that the curvature of the cone is not the curvature of the sphere that you have obtained. So how do we measure this, these kinds of things? Well, for the, um, for the cur intrinsic curvature of a protein, uh, we use the, this method that we developed that is called nanoparticle directed virus like particle assembly, where we take, and with the bromozyte virus you can, you take a nanoparticle uh, uh, of well defined radius uh, that you can adjust uh, the radius of, and you build the shell on its surface. So you are going to end up with a bunch of magic numbers, uh, T numbers, that is including the T equals 3, which you can observe here. It's a nice carry um, image. It's not as nice as the ones we see in this meeting. The gold scatters like crazy, okay? So uh, we, we cannot have the same resolution. You get shot noise from electrons being scattered from, from, uh, from, from gold. But it is indistinguishable at the resolution we have from the, from the normal file. And then you can build T equals 3 and, and show the T equals 2 and T equals 1 like this by constraining the assembly with your force. And then you can run equilibrium experiments where you ask, what is the equilibrium constant for free protein when I am in the cage formation uh, around the nanoparticle as a function of radius? And uh, so you get plots like this. We have total subunit concentration here and the fraction of protein in cage form here. And this is, this is a very sigmoidal, very stiff plot yeah, that tells you that this is a very cooperative uh, type of, 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 uh, of assembly or, or chemical reaction. And from these plots, we can, we can use a, a Hill model uh, that has been used for, for polymerization for ages and get the, the chemical potential as a function of the radius of particle. And then you talk with the you know, this is, I swear, this is the last, the only uh, equation I have. Um, you, you have this uh, free energy gain uh, at, at assembly that, that you can separate in parts that don't depend on the radius of the, of the particle and parts that do depend. And from there, you can get the curvature free energy. And you can know what is the effective intrinsic radius of curvature for the bromozyg virus subunit? And how big the difference between it is from the 
14 nanometer that you observe in a particle. And that tells you how much stress, elastic stress, there is in, in, in a normal bromozyg virus. And that's what stiffens the, the shell. That's what makes it uh, uh, pretty hard and resilient. That's the biggest contribution to, to energy. There are some, this is a, an aside, there you can use different exogenous cargo encapsulation, and you are going to get very different results. This, what is surprising about this experiment that we, we've done about 15 years ago, um, well, maybe 10, or maybe less, um, the, um, uh, we, put, we took iron platinum particles and, and they, they formed the nicosahedron. Oh, yes. Um, they form the nitrosahedron even if the, the charge on the inner uh, surface of the case is deemed to be isotropic. The end termini of the virus are fluffy and, and they make a nice uh, uniform isotropic shell. And, but somehow these particles, when they get in the virus to form, a multi-core particle, you can see from these projections, from these classes here, that uh, they tend to orient themselves as the microsahedron. So this, I think, illustrates the fact that the fluctuations, probably, of that uniform n termini shell are not the same in, um, underneath the pentamer from a hexamer, and that changes the binding constant for, for nanoparticles. That's our hand waving. Um, explanation. Uh, you can do it with oligomers, the, this, this, uh, with short oligomers. You are going to get very uh, stressed with adjacent pentamer uh, cages. Uh, so, it, and obtain some very novel structures. So, the, 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 the cargo is really determining um, um, uh, the, the, uh, the result of the assembly. All right, so let's go to the result uh, a little faster. Take a, take a bunch of take a bunch of chromophores, put them now on the surface, functionalize the bromozyg virus with them, and uh, pump them all with light so that you get all of them, 240 at saturation. You get all of them in the excited state. They are at two nanometer apart, the nearest neighbors. So they are coupled electromagnetically, if you want, like threat. But there is no possibility of threat because everybody is in the excited state. So what's going to happen? The answer to this is provided by quantum mechanics. What's going to happen is because the symmetry of the virus because these chromophores are in identical size. If one goes off and emits a photon, everybody else goes off. So here is how it looks. This is uh, the red uh, curve shows the intensity emitted by a single virus particle um, as a function of time. In green, you have the intensity emitted by 200 chromophores that are in the focus of the laser beam that they are free. They are not on the virus. It, the green decays exponentially, as you might expect, the exponential decay of uncorrelated fluorescence. The red builds up like a phase transition. The transition dipoles of your chromophores are lining up together so that no one is like that. They are all like this. And so they do the wave and they emit like one. And this is why you get faster de-excitation and a burst of 10 picoseconds instead of a tri trickling, like trickling emission of 5 nanoseconds. And now you are going to ask me, what are you going to do with this? Well, um, Okay, I'll let you ask me that question then. And, uh, and uh, uh, so, but the, the, here is the take home point. 
you do it without a virus, or you mess up with the order on, on the virus, you swell it, for instance, by changing the PA. You put a more flexible ligand. You, you let uh, only the chromophores that are on the surface and they are disordered and they can fluctuate. You lose the effect. And so bromosaic virus is great because we can swell it, stick chromophores inside, compress it, and those chromophores are the ones that emit to, to lead to the effect. And maybe you can do this with some phages as well. So to, I think one, one can still learn from, from BMB. And um, uh, I would like to thank you for, for attention, my group, support, and a bunch of collaborators. And I'll be happy to take that question I suggested to you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have time for a question. So uh, you can you can do imaging by by time gating. If you time gate and you look only at the emission, ten picoseconds after you, your laser has excited the, the the particle, you can see that particle in a bunch of background noise. For instance, let's say you'd want to do confocal microscopy of systemic virus movement in plants. You are not going to be able because of the chlorophyll. They emit like phase. But this thing is going to give you a 100 signal to noise ratio if you time gate and you take your, your, your uh, photons only in that window where the particle emits. Oh. Yeah, why should the three probe fours uh, be in the dependency of those that are bound to the problem of the virus? Um, because the ones that are bound to the bromozyte virus are at two nanometer distance from each other. And um, when, so when you excite them, just like in van der Waals interactions, the electronic wave functions start to adjust their phases. And in van der Waals interactions, you get a force within two nanometers. You get a dispersion force, right? If you have these atoms far away, the van der Waals interactions are not important. So it's the same mechanism. It depends on the coupling. You have to have a coupling and a delocalized excited state that is uh, confined to, to the virus surface. One question. Most important question. It's one. Uh, one. Can you use any chlorophore? And the second one is how much? How much? Uh, uh, how much energy do you need to put into the chlorophore? The first, the first time we observed the effect was in a slim microscope from the biology facility, so it's perfectly uh, benign. Uh, SP9 is slim, slim microscopy, you know, 2 microwatts of average power. Um, and presumably you can use more than Oregon Green. Um, we have tried uh, body tea, it works with it, um, but that's, that's all I can say. Yeah. Nice talk, lockdown. Um, sorry. Hi. However, we do have to continue um, um, unless you want to sacrifice your coffee break. Because we have three more talks. So. Okay. I'll, 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 be a, I'll be around. Yes. Okay. Thank you much indeed. Okay. So our next speaker is Alan Davidson uh, from the University of Toronto. Um, I'm just, you know, now I'm checking every title, but it is the same as the one I hope it's Okay. So I can get this right. Well, I, I'm very happy to be here and thank you for letting me talk. Great meeting at a wonderful location. I'm going to um, not tell you too much about uh, 
biological system, but more a method that we've developed in our lab along with my ex-student, Joe Bondi, and he was at UCSF. And it's a really neat way to make uh, mutations in phages, especially to investigate non-essential genes, and I think it could be useful for a lot of people, so I thought I'd go over it today. But I wanted to start um, really with our motivation for this. To some extent, is we're starting to think a lot about phage therapy, because um, you're probably all familiar with this story about Tom Patterson and his wife Stephanie Strathy in San Diego. He had a terrible bacterial infection, and she drove the process to find phages to cure his asthmatobacter, and it worked, and she wrote this book. And, uh, and this case is really brought to the forefront of phage therapy can really work. So we're starting to think about that more. And as I'll describe in particular, we really think that the future of phage therapy is in design phages, not natural phages. But I, I think Stephanie is great, and this book is great for uh, publicizing our field. But I did want to start out by just talking a little bit about this concept of perfect predator. And I have to take uh, an opposite position about the title of her book. In fact, phages aren't a perfect predator. Um, and just to explain my point, tiger is a perfect predator. They're cool looking. Why is a tiger a perfect predator? Um, they're adapted to kill their prey and eat it. Actually, I did some research on this. Predators hunt and eat and get their nutrition from what they hunt. So that's a predator. They can kill and eat many different species of animals. They don't just have to eat an antelope. They don't live anywhere in the anyway. But anyway, whatever they do, they can, they'll eat anything. Not people that much, but they can eat a lot of different stuff. And no prey species can resist the tiger. They're, they're, they're going to kill whatever they want. And humans don't count because they're not really. Obviously, we can resist them. And the predatory behavior of tigers is pretty predictable. They see food, they jump on it, and eat it. Now, how do phages compare that? I argue that phages are not the perfect predator. They're not evolutionary adapted really to eliminate their host, and they don't actually eat their host. They parasitize their host. So phages are, are really parasites, if you look at the definition. They're also highly strained specific, so they can't predate to the, the parasite with just anything, as we all know, in particular species. And also, they're not irresistible. We know that phage, the field of bacterial resistance to phages is exploding now. Bacteria has probably hundreds of different systems and ways to defeat phages. So, that, so they, are, they can be resisted in many different ways. And also, the effect of phages when you release them into the wild is quite unpredictable. And, and the problem that I'm really going to focus on today is that point of is that phages are unpredictable. And one of the big reasons they're unpredictable is that they have, every phage has so many genes of unknown function. And any time we isolate a phage and want to treat a patient for the phage, we're introducing all these genes of unknown functions. And we know that uh, at least some of these genes can be virulence factors. And we know that many of the virulence factors in pathogenic bacteria come from phages. So I'm going to talk today about how we can deal with this problem of genes that are function. And I'll argue that if we want to have the more perfect uh, phages for phage therapy, I won't call them predators anymore, but we should get rid of these genes of unknown function. So our strategy in the, in the long term of the, of the kinds of phages we like to use for phage therapy is to first develop some optimized minimal passive phages. So these are phages where we strip away all of the unnecessary stuff and get it down to what we need for lytic growth. And then we can add back the things that we want to uh, kill a particular strain of bacteria. In particular, we need to have the, the right receptor binding proteins. And also, we can add other features to this chassis that will be um, optimal for specific strain. For example, for all these anti-phage defense systems, there are often phage genes that will resist them. Anti-CRISPRs are an example that we discovered in our own laboratory, but there's 
means that will oppose many of these other anti-stage defense systems. And we imagine that there's stage means that will block any anti-stage system. So when we look at a strain we want to kill, we can identify the anti-stage systems and load our therapeutic stage with the genes we need to oppose those systems. So just to um, emphasize the idea of what I'm talking about, chassis are amazing parts. And it's amazing what you can make from the same chassis. This is a real life example. I did research on chassis too because I wanted to make sure I spelled it right and knew what it is. But this is kind of an old example that those of us who are close to my age will remember the, the Lada. It was not known as one of the greatest cars ever made. It came from the Soviet Union. But amazingly, this car was built on exactly the same chassis as, as this car. And I don't know if the Spider was a great car or not, but it was faster and sharper looking than this. <laughs> but this is just, you know, we, we can build stages to do very different. This one might infect Salmonella, this one might infect Pseudomonas. So we can, if we can get a, a good chassis, we can build it into different things, ugly things like 529, for example, and sharp looking things like Sage Lambda. So, <laughs> or, yeah, so, this, so this is the idea. So how, how can we do it? So to develop these minimized chassis stages, we need to know which genes are not essential and eliminate them. So we're thinking about this, and what, um, and oh, this is just to, to give you a case of a real phage genome that's been studied a lot, and, and what percentage of the genome we think might be non-essential. I just put phage P2 up, because a lot of work's been done on this over the years. And the basic lesson here is that the genome's about 33,600 base pairs, and about 24,000 base pairs of this is essential for lytic replication. So you might imagine, in general, we could eliminate probably a third of the genes or more in a phage. This is a fairly small genome, too. So, so that's the, our challenge, is we may have to get rid of a third or even half of the phage genome to minimize. So how can we do this in an efficient way? And since we also do a lot of work on CRISPR in my lab, we, we could think about using CRISPR for this purpose. And luckily, I didn't have to think about it that much. My ex student, Joe Bondi, then and he started working with this system a few years ago. So, this is a, a CRISPR Cas system that's from Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And most of you have probably heard of uh, Cas9, it's the most popular CRISPR system. It's what's being used for all the exciting genome editing experiments. But um, this is an example of a type 1 system, Cas9 is type 2. And these type 1 systems are actually the most prevalent in, in bacteria. Uh, so that's one of the reasons that we um, put most of our research into the type 1 systems. Uh, but the, there's a distinct difference with, between type 1 systems and type 2 systems. The type 2 systems use the guide RNA to recognize a specific sequence in DNA, and then they make a single cut, like a restriction enzyme. But these uh, type 1 systems recognize DNA in the same way. They have a complex of cast proteins that binds to the guide RNA and recognizes uh, whatever you program it to recognize. But then, and they bind the DNA, but instead of just making a cut, the system recruits uh, helicase nuclease called Cas3. And this uh, helicase nuclease is a real lawnmower of DNA. Once it gets recruited to the DNA, it just goes wild and chews and chews in, in both directions. So you can use um, particular guides to target a particular spot. For example, in this case, this is a non-essential part of the Pseudomonas genome. This is a Pseudomonas enzyme that we're doing experiments in Pseudomonas. And this is just an example of the kinds of deletions you get. So 61 KB, 53 KB, and even we can, we've seen deletions of 100 KB. So if you want to knock out a prophase or knock out huge parts of a phage genome, a yeast genome, and even a human genome, this, these kinds of enzymes are great for that. But for an 
investigating individual genes in a phage are not really great because a 50 kb deletion isn't really going to give you information about which particular genes are essential. So luckily, uh, a student in Joe's lab, Lena Leon, um, started playing around with uh, mutations in this cas 3 uh, enzyme. And since it's a fairly typical looking helicase nuclease, she was able to pick out some residues that she uh, figured would knock out the helicase activity. So the idea is to trip, make a crippled helicase nuclease that might make much smaller deletions. And she was able to achieve this, and uh, they kindly sent us the Pseudomonas strain. The PAO1 is the standard lab strain, and they put this system into the uh, genome of, of this uh, strain. So that all we have to do is put a plasma into the strain that expresses a CRISPR RNA that targets whatever page you want. So what we uh, developed to it and others develop is a two-step process where you can take a phage, which is very small here, inject a much larger genome uh, into a cell. And the first step is you, you target your gene of interest with this mutant um, system. And this system is fairly inefficient, but what you'll get out, you just infect and make a lysate, you'll get out a, a bunch of phages. Most of them will be wild type, but some proportion will have uh, deletions in your gene of interest and, and fairly small deletions. And you can take this mixture and then plate it onto the same system, but with the uh, same CRISPR RNA, but with the wild type system, so that every wild type phage that hasn't gotten a deletion will be killed. And then you plate that and the plaques to get out will only be mutant phages. And we've shown that this works really well. And on the next slide, I'll just give you an example. Oh, I'm just give you an example first of what genome we use. This is just a phage that we isolated in the lab quite a few years ago called JDD68. And it's a fairly small genome and we did bioinformatics on it. And this just shows the white open reading frames are all genes of unknown function and there's genes for, this is a temperate phase genes required for the lysogen and a, and a few others. So there are a lot of genes of unknown function. So what we did here was make plasmids um, corresponding to each gene and each one expressed a CRISPR RNA that would target that particular gene and we, we just went through the genome with a lot of plasmids, so my student, the fellow who was doing this, had a whole bunch of strings with different CRISPR RNAs. We did the mutagenesis step, and this just shows you um, wild type phage and the phage that's been through the strain that makes the mutations on a strain with no CRISPR system expressed. You get lots of plaques on both sides, but when you plate on the strain that has the CRISPR system targeting the same gene that was mutated. The wild type phage, you get no plaques, but the lysate made from the strain that uh, made the little deletion mutants, you get some plaques. And then the cell just had to pick some of these and retest them in sequence. And then in this case, he targeted gene 41. And in this example, he got a 327 base pair deletion in gene 41. And we found that doing a single gene approach, we got deletions of various lengths down to from 13 base pairs up to 300 or more. But the, oh, can I even say here, the smallest 13 base pairs, which is kind of amazing because it's even smaller than the target of the CRISPR RNA itself. So, but we wanted to do it a little more efficiently so um, what Nafel did next is he uh, mutated with a, a spacer that um, targeted a particular gene. And this was, he'd already done single mutations, so he knew that this whole region of genes was not essential. But he targeted one gene, and then he plated the lysate produced, so targeted the mutate, mutagenic strain. And then he plated on strains that targeted genes next to the gene that he targeted. So when plaques appeared, he knew that the deletion was not just this gene, but also this gene, and he could go down the line in both directions from the gene targeted and find that 
the deletions were actually much bigger than we had expected at first. Oh my goodness, sorry. <laughs> That's good, I'm almost done. <laughs> That was that was a few times. See, I still have one thirty eight on that screen. That was fairly futile. <laughs> so so now we, we realize realize that with just targeting one gene we can actually get uh deletions up to the kind of size that we were really hoping for to get uh, these minimized stages. Um, so it, ultimately he was he targeted uh, twenty seven people genes of unknown function. It turned out 26 out of 27 could be deleted, which was pretty good. And the, the one is something interesting because we don't know what it is, but we know it's essential, so that could be something else to study. And the other thing he did that um, was cool is there's always a, some limit to how much you can take out of a, of a phage genome. You know, so this is a cop type phage, so if you make the genome too short, it won't pack, uh, package properly. So what Mattel did here is he did the same experiment where he targeted one gene, and in the wild type phase, he could see that, he, that deletions were extending into genes around the gene he targeted. But when he started with a phase that already had over 3,000 phase pairs deleted and targeted gene 24, he recovered no genes, no deletions that extended beyond gene 24, which told us we must. 3,000 must be about the most we can delete. Because once you deleted 3,000, you couldn't delete anymore. So this now pulled up. So we not only learned how many uh, genes we can delete from this phase, but we also uh, learned that the limit for this phase is, is around 3,000. And you know, we we know we knew there were, there were limits because in Lambda they done lots of studies, and in Lambda you could delete about. Uh, 10,000. So we were, we were kind of thinking we could delete 20% uh, because that's what you could do in Lambda, but in this phase we can only delete around 3,000. But I realized that the final size of both genomes after these maximal deletions is around 37,000, which maybe in a T equals 7 head, which we assume our phage has, that's kind of the lower limit of, of phage size. But we need to do a little more work on that. So to make genomes even smaller, we need maybe a different triangulation number, or maybe we can select mutations in the head that might make the space somewhat smaller inside the head, maybe negative charges. But that's an experiment that will be fun to do in the future. So this is my summary. Can be, as I said, we can this this whole process can be done quite rapidly. First time through was, was not so fast, but we could probably have done this in less than a month if you really wanted to streamline it. So you could do this with a lot of phages, and the system produces deletions of at least 3,000. We don't actually know the upper limit yet because the phage we used 3,000 was the upper limit, so we're working on that. And of course, I think most of us knew there is a limit to how much we can delete in a cost type phage, but we can try to get around that in various ways too. Um, and just to acknowledge, um, Nathel is the student who did this work. He just finished his master's and is going to Zurich to do his PhD, unfortunately. And Charles uh, helped out a lot on this too. And Christina, I think, is there. Is there? Has done a lot of the work on that page B68, which is going to be talking about this later. And Annie and Ruth are sitting here too, and they have posters which I highly recommend. And my uh, constant collaborator, Karen, Abby and her lab actually did this first and showed others how to do it. And uh, Joe, my constant collaborator also, uh, and his you know, trainees developed the system. And sorry, it's like I'm over, but it's the computer's fault. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, you have any information about how many spaces you could put into your plasma at one time to kind of catch your best at being able to target a specific Yeah, uh, we can make plasmas that, I mean, because it's a CRISPR comes in arrays, you can, you could put in a lot of different spacers on the same plasma, and we've done that to some extent. We've done at least two so far, but there's 
there's nothing to say you can't put three, five, or six. Um, so you, you could target a, a many genes at, at the same time, which could be interesting. Yeah, in, yeah. in the cases of pages where you don't necessarily know what or have some sort of idea of what might be essential or not, um, it could be helpful for kind of doing a bigger uh -huh. scan for the genome. Yeah. And sort of related to that, do you ever see, or at what frequency do you see families that kind of contribute to whether or not your genes might be essential? Um, I think that Marcel only saw those kind of mutants when he targeted an essential gene. So it, be, it becomes pretty obvious that you're targeting an essential gene because you, you really don't get any facts out. And if you do get a few and you sequence them, you see point mutations that don't change the open genes. And I should say that we have, there, we have various plasmids expressing this system too. So Joe has used it in, in E. coli and various other. I'm sure it could work in a different way. So yeah. When we're interested in that species. Yeah. <laughs> there are lots of questions. I'm going to take people that haven't asked questions recently. Thank you. Just one quick comment. Uh, 37 kb, when you're using a very biased phase to start with, i.e., lambda, it is probably coincidental. It may be coincidental, because but I, I like this exact coincidence. Also, got fixed things you may or may not want to call cost. Mm -hmm. uh, you can make 33 kb genome you know, relatively easy with one step, no problem. Yeah, but it, 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 it doesn't it doesn't rely on it doesn't rely on head a full head to recognize the stuff. Yeah, I. Yeah, I, this may have been a coincidence, but I thought it was a coincidence. I would highlight to cool people <laughs> to make it simple. <laughs> okay. But, you know, yes. we want to do more of these experiments and we'll see what's going on. Three more questions. Okay, so uh, Alex, very nice. Thank you. Neat sure. way to do genetic autopsy page. Have you thought about a third CRISPR enrichment? So you could, your second one tells you, you know, it's not in gene X, but for, you know, it's in gene Y. But then you move the space of closer to your gene X, you have a more precise solution. Um, yeah, you can, you can go either way. If you're only interested in big deletions, for example, you can mutate with one gene and then select on a strain targeting a gene a thousand away. So you, you could, right from the start, only look for big deletions and very quickly figure out which way you can go and where the essential genes are. Yeah, the second one, if you did a screen yeah. for that, you know, the face are right at the, uh, the in prominence, you could really make these more precise. Just by engineering or doing one more selection, not selection, but one more screen for those that are targeted right at the end. You mean the end of the scene? Of the gene of interest. If you wanted to knock out one gene. Yeah, yeah. You could look for, you could uh, look for cases where you made a small deletion in a gene by looking for something that uh, will still be killed by something with both ends of the gene. Yeah, if you, if you just wanted small deletions in a gene of interest, you could definitely do it that way. Yeah, especially when you have you know, five or six non-sexual genes, which often happens. You want to knock out one of these. Yeah, one of But interestingly, when we just um, mutated a gene and then selected uh, with a spacer that targeted the same gene, most of the deletions actually just knocked out that gene. So the system, it, it, clearly the, the size of the deletions made by the system is some sort of distribution, but if I were guessing, I'd say the most common mutations are in the Hundred base or less range, so it's, it's pretty good. If you want to just knock out one gene, that's usually what you're going to get, unless it's a really small gene. Um, last question. Thanks, Alan. That was really useful. Um, I was wondering, instead of uh, when you reach the limit of how much you can delete, instead of making the head smaller, could you just add in more DNA? Absolutely. Um, yeah, that's another. Something neutral, or maybe something even useful to make like a more yeah. Yes, definitely. And we're going to do experiments in that way, too. Okay. Uh, let's 
Ahí está. Ahí está. Hi everyone, first of all, I just want to thank the organisers for inviting me here. Um, it's a paper to share some of our work with you, in particular Fred, and thanks a lot for the invite. Um, so, <coughs> I'm going to try and tell you a little bit about what we do at Oxford Nanopore Technology. So, we're very much from the research department at Oxford Nanopore, so I'm going to touch a little bit on the, the technology and how it works, but really want to focus uh, a little bit more on, on what we're hoping to do next and, and how we, we can try and utilise a lot of the proteins and things that have been mentioned already in this conference for biotechnology applications. Uh, <laughs> I just point, we've got a touch screen. <laughs> there we go. Brilliant. <laughs> So, yeah, very briefly, Oxford Nanopore is, is we're a teenager now. We, we spun out from Oxford University in 2005, uh, founded by Hayden Bailey, who's, who's one of the professors at Oxford University, uh, still heavily involved in the company. Um, we are headquartered down in Oxford, so our main R&D hub is in this building. Uh, we've got about 400 employees who are in our R&D department who all work in this building in Oxford, just on the, the south side of the Science Park. And we've also got a, a huge production facility just uh, on the south side of Oxford. Just so happens to be built in the shape of one of our devices uh, and called the Minheim Building. So, um, we work an awful lot with, with academic collaborators and an awful lot of other partners. So, uh, a lot of what we're presenting here isn't just our own work, it's built up on, on multiple different collaborations and multiple different academics who have collaborated and, and worked and contributed towards it. So yeah, I just want to highlight this as a small snapshot of some of our partners that we've worked with, and we are always on the lookout for new collaborators and new, new academic So, what is it we're actually trying to do? Um, so we want to be able to enable the sequencing of anything by anyone, anywhere. It's quite a bold play. So I'll get back to the anything a bit later, but anyone, we, we want to really sort of democratise DNA sequencing in particular and enable anyone to be able to, to sequence their own DNA or RNA or at some stage protein. We don't think we should be sending samples off to a centralised sequencing lab and it should be very much in the hands of the people that want to get access to that information. So we're trying to make example tests and the use of our platforms so simple that anyone can use them without having to go through lots of training programmes that have specialist knowledge as to how to, to run and also interpret that information. The anywhere part of this, um, so we've got a range of platforms. Some of them are, are much larger, so for me, science, down the bottom, which are more targeted towards the big sequencing centres in the traditional sense, looking at sort of large top gen sequencing studies where you can see tens of thousands of, of genomes a year. Um, but equally, we've got our little MinEye. Um, so our MinEye is our, our, the first device that we launched commercially and it is a, a small USB stick size sequencer. As long as you've got a laptop and a power supply, you can pretty much take that anywhere you want and sequence it. Whether it's in the field, whether it's in the Arctic, or whether it's on the International Space Station. We've been involved in, in a lot of sort of, it's not only the anywhere in geographic terms, but also in terms of surveillance and, and virus surveillance. So we've been involved in lots of outbreak surveillance systems, all the way back to 2014, going back to Zika, Ebola, and recently the, the coronavirus outbreak, where getting samples out from those situations can often be challenging. So if we can bring the sequencer and the analysis methods to where those outbreaks are, it should mean that you can actually track these things much faster without having to send samples back to another lab or somewhere else to work out what's going on. So, the core of our technology is, is all based on nanopore sensing. Um, so it, it's a, a concept where we've essentially got two chambers, which have got an electrode on either side of them, and they're separated by a, a, an insulating membrane. We stick a biological nanopore in this membrane, so that any flow between the two chambers has to go through that, that nanopore. We've got a very sensitive detector on these electrodes that can then detect any change or alteration in the ion flow between that nanopore. So, the concept is you've essentially got your nanopore, you, if it's a good nanopore and it's well behaved, it 
nice and flat, it doesn't gate, it doesn't block, um, it doesn't misbehave, and you get a, a steady flat signal. As soon as a molecule comes near or translocates or interacts with the top of that manifold, you get a deflection or a change in that signal. So some of the molecules will go all the way through, some will sort of get stuck in the top and might pop back out again, others will just sort of tickle the rest of the or tickle the top of that core and um, won't actually interact or, or, or go in there, but you can still see a, a change in signal. So as long as we get a, a characteristic and um, reproducible signal, we can use that to identify what the molecule is or what is actually interacting with that molecule. Uh, I apologise for the resolution of this video, it's not quite the, the atomic scale that we've seen in some of the others. So this gives a, an overview of the, the, the concept of how we do our sequencing. So we've got the, the membrane material in the background, we've got a biological nanopore, we have a, a motor protein which attaches onto the, the DNA or RNA strand, and then the motor protein feeds that strand through the nanopore. So it's this motor protein which is actually controlling the movement of that, that DNA through the nanopore and makes sure it's going at a constant and consistent rate. So, Every time you actually see the base, the, the fan going through the banana core, you get this characteristic signal, or what we term a squiggle. This is essentially an electronic measurement, of the, uh, looking at the iron flow through that banana core, and seeing every time you get a base movement through there, you get a slightly different level. So we've got some algorithms that are able to interpret this signal and then turn it back into a, a DNA or RNA sequence. One of the key features of our, our platform is that it's not just one nanopore that's taking a measurement at any one time. This is a huge array that we've got, where from our smallest device on the, the Flongel, all the way up to our Prometheus line, we've got all these nanopores working in parallel. So we've got 126 on our smallest setup, up to 3,000 on our, on our Prometheus line, which are taking individual measurements and individual strands going through each of those nanopores. So this scales up quite a lot. Um, so on our platforms, you, you can see that we've got individual channels which are all isolated from each other, which will allow them to generate an awful lot of data all in parallel. So, why nanopore sequencing? Um, so, we've got very simple workflows. The sample test can be done within five minutes. You can start sequencing That's from DNA extraction to loading onto the flow cell. Um, so you can get your data back very, very quickly. There's no tax across to our platforms. It's all the, the reagents you pay for, not the actual platforms themselves. So it's very accessible and it's portable. I'll admit I knew anyway. One of the big advantages of this is that it's real-time data. So as soon as you start our run, you can start getting data back up to that straight away. You don't need to run it for a day or two days and wait that data comes off in real time. So you can get instant feedback and instant results back from your, your sequencing. This gives you the control to, to start and stop your runs as you want. So you, you don't need to run it for 24 hours. If you find that you've got enough data after an hour or two hours, you can stop that experiment and you can reuse that flow cell later on for another experiment. I meant it also doesn't degrade or change that DNA in any respect. So if you did actually want to recover it or use it for something else further downstream, you can pull that DNA back out from our flow cells and reuse it in other applications. Um, on the actual data, okay, you get an awful lot of data off from our, our platform, particularly the larger ones. Um, we can sequence very long pieces of DNA. So if you can get a long piece of DNA to that nanopore and extract it in one piece, we can pretty much sequence it. Our record so far is over four megabytes of DNA in one go. One of the other big advantages now of course is we're, we're actually looking at the molecule of interest. We're not making copies of it. We're not synthesizing new versions of it. You are looking at your molecule of interest. So if there are any modifications or any damage spaces or, or, or differences in that, you can pick that up directly. So 
basically. <laughs> there we go. Um, so I'm just going to mention this briefly one of our new chemistries that's come out um, called our Dutex sequencing method. And this is our, our new high accuracy sequencing method. Um, there's been lots of stories in the past about the accuracy of nanopore technology or nanopore sequencing in general. So the duplex method we've got is a, a new method in which actually sequences both strands. So you can sequence your first strand, and then as that goes through the nanopore, um, you can see that the end of your second strand gets pulled close to the top of the nanopore, and we can capture this second strand straight away. So you sequence your forward and your reverse strand in one go. And with our, our new stereo base cooler algorithm, which essentially uses both of those strands in one go to try and work out what the DNA sequence is, we can now the next one again. Move on to the next slide. Thank you. So with this method, we can now get Q32 accuracy. For those that aren't familiar with Q scores, that's less than one error in a thousand bases from a raw read, single molecule DNA sequence. If you look at consensus accuracies and, and, and pile things up, then that Q score will go even higher. But the raw read, single molecule accuracy, we are now above Q30. Right, so let's get on to the next slide here. Uh, so I mentioned earlier that we can detect DNA modification. Okay. Um, any modification that we so far put through the nanopore system, we can detect the difference in the signal. The big challenge for us at the moment is trying to, to automate this process to make it simple and easy for, for people to actually pick up these modifications. So our base call is a, a very highly trained machine algorithm that needs us to sort of see these modifications before they can identify exactly what they are. So, so far we put 5 mc 5 HMC as two of the most biologically relevant and, and biologically um, prevalent modifications. And trained our base call is up to identify these. Um, so we can now detect 5 mc uh, above 90, oh, sorry, that's not working too well. So, so yeah, we can now detect 5 mc over 99% accuracy. Um, all of this is a simple click within our software, which runs our platform called Minan. So you don't need to do anything else to your DNA. There's no horrible chemicals or anything else that you need to, to modify your, your DNA with to make it compatible with other sequencing methods. This essentially comes for free when you sequence your, your, your original DNA. Of course, this won't work if you're using amplified DNA, um, but for native sequencing, you get your modifications for free. So we've done this for, for 5MC, 5HMC. We've also got a 6MA model just coming through, uh, and we're hoping to add this list of, of other modifications that will be detected automatically when you sequence your native shot. And um, we can also do RNA as well. By this, I mean we actually sequence the RNA directly and detect the RNA and not the cDNA copy. So I'm not going to go into the structure of RNA, I think most people are familiar with it. Very, very similar to DNA. Um, it's a mostly single stranded rather than double, and you get one or two different bases coming through, and a ton more of different modifications. But it's exactly the same principle. So we take the strand, we attach a, a sequencing motor onto the end of our RNA strand, and then we feed it through the nanopore. So we use a slightly different motor on our RNA compared to DNA. So our RNA motor runs three to five rather than five to three, uh, and it's a little bit slower. Um, but because we're sequencing single stranded RNA, um, you can get a lot more information out from that than you will ever do for looking at copies of it. Um, so I mentioned our, our new RNA kit uh, is now up at 96%, just over 96% accuracy. Um, we think some of this difference in our error rate from RNA to DNA is due to the number of modifications that you see in RNA. It doesn't account for all of it but it does account for a significant portion. So we can now, I say, 96% accuracy, and we can get over 30 million RNA reads from a single flow set. Uh, and yes, we can get modifications as well. So the RNA modification field is a, a much more diverse and complex situation in DNA, 
um, depending on, on exactly which, which publication you, you, you read, somewhere between about 150 and 200 categorized RNA modifications to date. I suspect there's an awful lot more out there that haven't quite been found yet, but with our methods, you can detect these. Um, so, um, so yeah, here are just a few that, that we've already shown that we can detect, which is the 6MA, the inosines, the 5MC, pseudo-uridine, and um, this one's quite a big one for the, the mRNA vaccines at the moment, um, and it's one of the common white ones, the M1 pseudo-uridine, um, which is used in a lot of the, the mRNA vaccines. But every single modification that we put through our, our nanopores, we've been able to detect the signal difference. The challenge for us at the moment is now to, to train these up and make sure that our base callers can identify these and directly call them and make it simple for everyone to get access to this information. So, um, the heart of our system is, like, well, I'm slightly biased here, a lot of the other companies, the engineers will say it's the platforms and other parts, but to me, it's the most of the four. Um, these are the two components that are absolutely fundamental for, for getting our RNA and DNA sequencing methods working. So, just to give an overview of everything which goes on within our platform and, and how, how it all comes together, we've got the, the sequencing chemistry, which is essentially the, the pores and the motors and the feathers and the sample pack and everything else. We've got the run conditions, so this is how we actually run our, our flow cells. So temperature, voltage, buffers, um, fuel type, all sorts that go into there. We combine these two onto the, the platform, which is our, our here it's the Prometheum, like our Minime, um, which will also contribute a certain amount of sort of platform noise or platform signal to our, our squiggles. All of this combines together to give our, our signal or our squiggle. So this squiggle is then fed into our base coolers. As I mentioned earlier, all our base coolers now are, are neural net based and are our machine learning guided algorithms, which have two main components. We've got the training set, which is essentially the, the DNA strands or the RNA strands that we, we show to these algorithms to train them and show what, what the sequence should be, and the architecture of these models. So you can get big models, small models, more complex models. Um, essentially, the bigger the model, it's usually slightly more computationally expensive to run it, but you generally get better, better accuracy and so on and so forth. So all of this comes together to give it a sequence at the end, and hopefully give you a high accuracy score. So I'm going to focus a bit more on the, the cores and the, the motors down here. So we've got a motor that works, but we're always looking to improve it and make it better and try and optimize it as well. So we've got a, a, a big effort at the moment using our machine learning guided enzyme engineering methods, which are taking a lot of the latest tools, such as the um, protein language models, the 3D structure, the hybrid models, um, ESM, um, MPNN, for anyone that's, that's familiar in the field, to try and use these to optimize and improve our, our, our motors. And by that, I mean, we're, we're generally looking for things that move fast, that move consistently. So we want to make sure we've got a motor that is always moving forward at the same speed and the same rate. So we set up several high screening through the pipelines, which are taking advantage of some of the liquid handling robots that we've got in house, to automate our process all the way through from um, the design phase. We get our plasmids delivered into a plate. We essentially put that plate into a liquid handling robot, and then that's an express, purify, make our adapters, do the license making process and then load that directly onto one of our, our platforms. The other aspect is the, the nanopore. Um, so our nanopore is absolutely fundamental to our system. And all of our discrimination comes from the nanopore. We have a few different engineering efforts that go on out in, in house on the, on the nanopore. Um, but I'm just going to highlight here one of our, our recent efforts to elongate our nanopore. So it seems a bit weird why it wants to elongate or make something a bit longer. Um, but this, this is all to do with our, our read head length and making sure that we can get better discrimination and better accuracy from our, our DNA as it passes through. If you've only got one read head, you've only got one chance of seeing that DNA sequence as it passes through the, the nanopore. So if the DNA splits or it pauses or it misbehaves, you've essentially locked that in a, a single read head. So what we've done is actually created two read heads, 
and engineered on nanopores to, to be able to have two parts of that that really interact with the contribution to the physics. This also massively helps with, with hydroponics. Um, one of the challenges with, with nanopore sequencing is your, your signal is being determined by changes in that base structure. If the bases are exactly the same, you don't get a change in that signal and you end up with these, these great big flat sections when you've got hydroponics going through your nanopore. So what we've done in our latest generation of nanopores is actually stick out these three reed heads and separate them a bit more to make sure that we can get better chemical polymer atrophy. As you can see down here, so these flat levels are not quite so flat anymore. There's a lot more information and context in the um, So yeah, just quickly, um, I want to say that our sequencer isn't just a sequencer. We've designed it as a sequencer as one of our first applications. But there is an absolute ton of information that comes through from this signal. So depth sizes was something that was mentioned in, a, in one of the keynote talks. You can work out the depth size from the helicase and it's good. You can work out how many times your motion moves forward, how many times it moves backwards, how many times it pauses, um, all sorts of information about the motor behavior but also on the, the port side as well. You can see where the ports are gating, how stable they are to certain buffers, conditions, voltages, all sorts. So, just want to highlight that we have marked it as a DNA sequencer, but it is a single molecule assay that you can get tons and tons of single molecule experiments done all in the place. And just finally, I do want to say we, we are always on the hunt out for new candidates, pores and proteins and, and motors. So, if anyone knows the one that might be useful, I'd love to hear about it. Okay, thank you very much indeed. We have time for short questions before we can. So, for something like RNA, you can I think it's, it's extra information. So the motor does change, um, it does pause sometimes, and it does go faster and slower. But if you can model that information and it's consistent, you can actually use that to work out what structure the motor is going through. It's, it's a, a new field that's opening up an awful lot at the moment. And, um, I think the more we understand it, I think the more information, the more predictability is going to come through from that. But we can certainly see differences in behavior when we have either um, a, a RNA DNA hybrid strand. We only see from the RNA side of it, but it sort of irons out or, or smooths out any of the secondary structures compared to when we're sequencing single stranded RNA. So we think there is information in there. Mm -hmm. Did you ever try to couple this core and the core to more to facilitate the proof? Clip mix, or anything? Yeah, um, if you have a look back at our, we, we, we did a big tech talk last year, um, our London calling conference with our protein sequencing approach coming through, which was using essentially that, that method. Um, we've got some collaborators over in the US who are also working on the clip X approach to protein sequencing, um, either in a, a push or a pull function. So some of them are trying to feed the protein in. We've got slightly more challenges on that respect in terms of the deceptive and tertiary structure. Um, but we're also working with what will turn the out or the full method for the protein sequencing. It's exactly the same principle. So it's a polymer, put it through a nanopore. You just need the most to equip. Oh, no. <laughs> so for the motor proteins, uh, do they bind on the ends of the experiment or uh, so we we have a whole load of different motors that we use internally in research. The motor that we have in our product is actually pre-bound to our adapters. So we have that motor on our adapters, which then gets tapped onto the end of the, the DNA or the RNA strand. So it means that you will always get that um, the start of the strand when you the motor comes in. We have a method of essentially pre-binding it then activating that once they get strangled through the nanopore. So when it's in solution or when it's, it's, it's doing the sample prep, 
for those who stalled at the start of the lap. All right. Thank you very much indeed. It's time for coffee, so let's thank all of the speakers of this morning's session. And we'll see you back in half an hour. Thank you.